welcome everybody to this webinar on saving and investment strategies for long-term financial planning, uh, particularly for retirement. My name is Josh Rao. Those of you who have been taking my massive open online course, my MOOC on the finance of retirement and pensions already uh, know me. Some of you, I want to uh, welcome my students to this uh, webinar. Very much looking forward to your participation. I'll tell you in a moment how you can participate and also to welcome everybody, uh, everyone who might be watching this uh, around the U.S. and around the world and invite you to participate in this very exciting webinar. You know, we're going to be talking today about the, uh, you know, the strategies for long-term financial planning, saving and investment, particularly when you're thinking about a strategy for saving for retirement. Talk a little bit about some of the conventional wisdom and we'll be asking whether that conventional wisdom is right for everybody or not. Um, so welcome to all. I'm really excited today about the panel that we have here with us today. And I have uh, three very esteemed guests. I'd like to introduce them, uh, introduce them now. So the first uh, guest with me here is uh, William Sharp, Bill Sharp, the Stanco 25 Emeritus Professor of Finance at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Welcome, Bill. Uh, Bill has a uh, PhD in, and a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in economics from UCLA. So he did all of his uh, education at UCLA. He joined the faculty here at Stanford in 1970. And in 1990, he received the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. He is one of the originators of the capital asset pricing model, a model that will be familiar to my students. And he also developed uh, the Sharpe Ratio for investment performance analysis, named after him. He's published articles in every possible professional journal. He's written several books, including Portfolio Theory and Capital Markets, and we're delighted to have him with us here today. My second guest is uh, John Amerix. Now, John Amerix is a principal and head of active equity uh, research at the uh, Vanguard Equity Investment Group. His team manages or co-manages Vanguard's active stock funds using quantitative methods. Uh, Vanguard, as many of you know, is a uh, mutual fund firm, an investment firm with around two trillion dollars in assets. Uh, they provide mutual funds and exchange traded funds have been done doing mutual funds since 1929. He's also done a, a, a great amount of academic research uh, published in top journals. So welcome, John. Delighted to have you here, John Emmerichs. Uh, and my third Happy guest to today is John Kniff. John Kniff is a managing director uh, and quantitative portfolio manager for the TIA CREF organization since 2006. TIA CREF was founded in 1918, and it's also an investment firm. They specialize in the needs of nonprofit organizations and their employees. John Kniff was previously the director of U.S. research at Morgan Stanley Investment Management and has been a portfolio manager at several other investment firms. So welcome to, uh, to my entire panel, and, and thank you all very much for being here. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, call your attention to some of the features of this, uh, of, of, of this uh, webinar today. So first we have uh, a, a Twitter feed, and I encourage you to tweet in any questions that you might have or any comments that you might have about this, about this webinar. And that includes questions and comments that you would like me to uh, ask our panel. So the hashtag for this is going to be Rao Finance. So hashtag Rao Finance. That's my last name and finance, all one word. And uh, please feel free to use Twitter and uh, get the social media buzzing about uh, this exciting webinar today. Another way I'd like to invite you to participate is uh, through some polls and survey questions that I'm going to be asking you. And we've designed four poll questions for you that you're going to be able to uh, answer. And to, uh, I'm very interested in hearing what, what your answers are to these questions. And when I have the results, uh, I'm going to be telling you about the audience here today, what you've answered, and what the, uh, what the distribution of, uh, of responses has been. So let me walk you through what the questions are. The first question is in how many years you plan to retire. And you can either say, I don't know, or you can say a range of dates, or you can say you never plan to retire. Uh, the second question is going to be what percentage of your 401k, or you can also answer this you know, if you have other uh, employer-provided defined contribution funds, what percentage of those funds are invested in stocks or equity mutual funds? So I'm interested in how much stock market investing uh, you all are doing. So I think that will be a very interesting uh, question. The third question I'd like you to talk about, uh, answer yes or no, is do you think, this is a, an opinion question, do you think that stocks are safer in the long run than they are in the short run? Yes, no, or I don't know. That's a question for you. And the fourth question is uh, whether you have reduced or do you plan to reduce your exposure to stocks in your 401k or other defined contribution retirement account as you approach retirement, yes or no. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, seeing your responses to, this, uh, to these survey questions and to presenting you with the, uh, the distribution of responses that this uh, wonderful viewership here gives. 
Well, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, jump right in and, and turn to the themes for today and uh, start right out by asking my panel uh, the first question that I had, which is uh, really, I want to know, uh, maybe uh, John Amrix, maybe you can, you can start out with this. Uh, what is the number one consideration that people planning, doing long-term financial planning, particularly planning for retirement, what is the number one consideration that they need to be thinking of? Um, you need to start saving. You need to get in the plan. Uh, very simply, uh, there are a lot of people out there with opportunities to save that they're not taking advantage of. And so I would say the number one thing is make sure you participate and start putting something away through the vehicles available to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, you know, in terms of uh, make sure you're participating, what, what exactly should people be participating in? Maybe you could just be a little more specific about what, what, what are the opportunities Abs people Absolutely. Have yeah. The, the big one that a lot of people have are 401k plans through their employer or 403b plans if they're in the nonprofit sector. Those plans will allow them to defer portions of their income and put those away uh, for the future and invest them. And we'll talk a little bit more about how they can invest them later. Mo and importantly, many of those plans feature what's called an employer match, which essentially uh, provides an additional incentive for people to save. If you put 4% of your pay in, your employer may match up to, say, an additional 4%. Um, you should definitely take advantage of that. You get an immediate return on your contributions by doing so. Free money, in essence. If you're able to contribute the in money essence. today, then your employer is giving you free money. If you're not, then you're not going to be getting access to those to those funds. Now, you're uh, not cashing your paycheck. That's what I like to say. You're not cashing your paycheck. I like that. Uh, now, yeah. uh, Bill Sharp, maybe you could uh, uh, say something about the, about the, the following question, which is, you know, how can people even begin to think about how much they need to uh, to save? You know, where, where where do they even start? I mean, what's a, what, what what kind of what kind of rules would you would you think about uh, giving people or guidelines in terms of thinking about how much they need to save to be able to be prepared for retirement? Well, it, it depends on sort of the obvious things. How many years you've got before you plan to or at least hope to retire. <clears throat> how much money you're saving as a percentage of your salary. And um, what you think you might earn on those investments, understanding that in all likelihood, that's going to be a range of distribution, as you point out in the course. So you need to think about all those issues. There are rules of thumb that if you start at a fairly young age, the total that you and your employer need to put in as a percent of your salary is probably somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. Now that's 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 making a lot of assumptions, <clears throat> but uh, I think the important thing that that number is typically larger than most people think it is it is required. And you've got to save a lot in almost every circumstance. Uh, and, and so you, you've got to find a way to put in numbers that are in that range. And John, can if you, you agree with that, what, do you, what, 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 what kinds of uh, savings, saving strategies yes. do you uh, advise for your clients? Yes. Well, it, your class earlier on savings for retirement had an assignment and you had a 10% contribution rate. The Employee Benefit Research Institute in a recent study showed that the average American is contributing 7% uh, of their salary to retirement. So uh, as Bill Sharp uh, mentioned, those numbers generally, Americans generally need to save more for retirement. Uh, definitely look for opportunities for company match uh, and consider a plan, consider retirement readiness, look out many years in the future, or if you're approaching retirement, potentially meet with a financial advisor and have a budget for your retirement and look at how your investments can match income, create income and match that for your budget. Now, one, one thing I've always found very interesting, I, I talk to people about, about these, uh, these issues, sometimes people don't even really know whether they're saving in a 401k plan or not. Uh, how can, how can that be? I mean, so if, if you just start a job, is it, uh, you maybe talk a little bit about what, what typically happens to people if they don't take any action, if you take no action. Uh, do you, is some money going into an account or not? What, 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 how does this typically work? Uh, John Emmerich, maybe you want to take a shot at that so, one? It's a, it's a big uh, area. It's one of the, the areas where I think there's been a, a lot of very recent research in the last 10 to 15 years about this issue of defaults. What happens to an employee that starts a new job um, are they in the plan to begin with or not? And, you know, 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, 
the normal situation was you had to get up and proactively go sign up for the retirement plan in order to be in it. And um, surprise, surprise, lots of very young workers who were in their first job uh, were not real interested or real cognizant of these issues around retirement saving. And a lot fewer people signed up for those plans than I think most benefits officers, most policymakers would like to have seen. You know, research that's been done by behavioral economists and others over the years has shown an incredibly power, powerful effect of just flipping the default on its head, auto-enrolling people into a plan. And that will get people to save. It will solve the first problem that I told you needed to be solved. It gets someone in the plan and saving. Uh, but it can raise other issues, as you mentioned, of people not being aware of, of, of what's going on. But, um, you know, that's ultimately you've got to get involved. You've got to get engaged to understand what's happening with your retirement money. And it's very important to do so as young as you can. So if I, if I might just sort of summarize just something we've heard, you know, uh, for those of you out there, I mean, it, it may be that you're watching this and you're thinking, well, what, what exactly is, is going on? Am I contributing to my own retirement fund right now or not? Um, you may not remember what you did when you signed up for your job. You may not remember how much money is going in there. And it might be useful to, especially uh, you know, those of you who are students in the, in the open online course, you know, we've done these kind of, this kind of spreadsheet modeling. It might be useful for you to compare what it is, you know, go look up what, it, what, it, what is it you're actually doing. Are you, are you really contributing to your, to your 401k or not? How much money is going in there every month? And, and is it likely to, uh, to be sufficient? By the way, as I'm mentioning the MOOC, uh, one thing I did want to do is I wanted to just invite all viewers, uh, even if you just tuned in just for this webinar, to feel free to check out the MOOC. Uh, the link to the MOOC is available online. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's available, you can see it, the same link uh, that you found uh, this, uh, this webinar at. You can also find the link to the, uh, to the, to the MOOC. Uh, and feel, you know, anyone is welcome. It's not too late to sign up. Feel free to just uh, sign up and uh, check out all the interesting things that we're that we're that we're doing there. Uh, the the URL is is www.novoed.com/rao-finance. Um, so inviting everybody to uh, feel free to, to to check that out. So going back to uh, the panel now, just a couple of other issues about uh, about saving I want to talk about before we we move on to uh, to, to investing to asset allocation. One big question I was wondering about is uh, it seems like people are increasingly uh, kind of d doing things to try to access their money from their 401k before the time that they're actually uh, retired. Um, anybody want to, maybe Bill Sharp, you want to talk a little bit about, about, about that? I mean, are, do, do, do people uh, you know, borrow from their 401ks? Is that a good idea to be borrowing money from your 401k to try to move consumption forward? Uh, I would say, as a general rule, probably not a good idea. There are obviously circumstances in which it may be necessary if there's a, an emergency need for, for funds. But since the major problem that we see is that people don't seem to be saving enough, uh, if you borrow, that is therefore less, uh, unless you pay it back, and uh, that, that may be questionable whether you will or not. Then there are all kinds of tax issues, which I can't say I fully understand, but I, I think we should we should be negative about borrowing um, absent a really really compelling reason i believe in most cases if you lose your job or you quit you owe the money back is that is that right uh, john amerix do i understand that correctly it, it that is a feature of the 401k system for sure um i believe the rules are slightly different for different types of plans um but for most people that are in the private sector that's going to be an issue that's one of the things you really should worry about if you don't know whether you're required to pay it back when you lose your job or when you change jobs, you should ask at the time you go to, to get the loan. Mm -hmm. well, now, what, what, what about people who are uh, approaching retirement? Actually, I was looking at some of the uh, survey results, the distribution of uh, your responses uh, to the question, not from uh, today, but the question in the MOOC uh, about uh, how many years away you are from retirement. I noticed that there is definitely a mass of, of people in this course who are zero to 10 years before retirement. And I imagine that some of you, if you've uh, been taking this course, you might have actually taken a look at your own accounts. And some people may have seen, well, gee, actually, it, it seems like I have this kind of hodgepodge of accounts from old jobs. You know, I have a 401k from this job, and I have, uh, I have an IRA here, a Roth IRA here. Um, 
You know, uh, actually, I'll stick with you, John Amerix. I mean, what, what, what do you advise people to do who are, say, zero to ten years away from retirement, you know, getting, getting close, and they have this kind of hodgepodge of accounts out there? What, 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 do you have any advice for, for those people? Well, I, you know, I think uh, the hodgepodge by itself, um, it doesn't necessarily create a problem. I want to be, want to be clear about that. Um, we, we would argue as well as most other financial services companies that consolidating your assets, uh, you know, allows you uh, a lot of convenience. Um, you know, it, it is harder to manage when you have a lot of things in different places. Um, but the bottom line is if you've got to look at all of that together and if it constitutes a diversified portfolio, it may not necessarily uh, be, be a problem. So, so by consolidating, you mean maybe rolling over into a traditional IRA or even perhaps a Roth IRA? Right, that's correct. And th there are an awful lot of tax issues to tax and um, other other uh, legal issues um, that you need to sort through. There are trade-offs to be made when you make those those rollovers, and it may be one of those areas where, especially for people close to retirement, uh, John John C's advice about talking to an advisor to work through some of these things gets increasingly important, um, especially if there's company stock in a 401k plan, because that's subject to special treatment according to the tax laws that you probably ought to think about. Company stock in a 401k plan, well, that, that gets to uh, the next uh, kind of general set of topics I want to discuss, which is uh, investment strategies in 401k plans. Uh, and you know, many of you are probably thinking, okay, I get the message. We need to save a lot. And all right, so now that we're, if, if, so let's suppose we've kind of optimized this saving. Uh, what, you know, what should we be investing in? Now, uh, John Amrex, you just alluded to the idea that there are a lot of people out there who are investing uh, in, in company stock, uh, the stock of their, of their own company. Uh, you know, actually, I want to turn to Bill Sharp a little bit about this, since Bill is one of the founders of modern finance theory. I mean, what does modern finance theory tell us about uh, what, whether you should be investing in your own company's stock or not? Um, simple answer, bad idea. <clears throat> the, uh, the argument is that in many situations, if not, not all, certainly, but most, um, there's plenty of company-specific risk in your job, in your employment. If things go bad in your company or in your industry, uh, your job may be jeopardized. You may have to suffer a cutback in salary or hours, what have you. So the last thing you want to do is add to that specific risk. The basic mantra of being widely diversified uh, would argue that when you take the human capital into account, uh, you've got a concentration of some sort, depending on your, your job, uh, company-specific risk. So. Adding to that by holding company stock is not a good idea. There's a tension here because many companies want employees to have company stock, give them incentives to work harder and be more devoted to the company. So there's a tension between what might be good from a company policy standpoint and what is good from a strictly investment standpoint. But by and large, a lot of people in the investment industry would say 10% or under you know, absent compelling reason, keep it down in the single digits if you must do it at all. I mean, in essence, you know, your eggs are sort of already in that basket. And by investing yes. in company stock, you're putting more eggs in the basket, in that same basket. And your eggs are already in the basket because your financial future depends upon how well, you know, how, how whether you get to keep your job. And uh, do you really want to also be investing in the stock of a company that's going to be deciding on whether you keep your job or not, uh, especially since the fortunes of that company will determine whether or not you keep your job? There, there were some, historically, there were some very tragic cases. IBM went into a tailspin at one point. And many of their executives have their entire retirement savings in company stock. Uh, and, and there have been other cases of that sort. I don't think that happens as much anymore. Most 401k plans are cognizant of this issue, and they tend not to encourage people to have huge concentrations in company stock. But it's something to watch out for. Mm, definitely a, a, a red flag. Um, well, I want to talk now just about more generally about investment strategies. So let's suppose that uh, you know you've reached the point where you've, you've sort of optimized your savings strategy and you're you're saving as much as you can. You're taking advantage of employer matches. Uh, what about the investment side of things? You know, how how should you actually allocate these assets? And I just want to turn to 
to, to John Kniff uh, of TAA Cref and just ask him, uh, John, you know, what would you advise as just kind of the general investment strategy for people? I mean, where do you start? I imagine some of our viewers are probably, they're probably at this point, you know, kind of scrambling around their laptop, looking at their portfolios and thinking, oh my gosh, what a mess. What am I doing here? What, what, can you just give us just some general advice about, about, about how asset allocation should be looking uh, for younger people, middle-aged people, people approaching retirement? What do you think? Sure. Well, here at TIA Cref, I manage the TIA Cref life cycle funds. Now, what is that, by the uh, way, life cycle funds? A, a life cycle fund is a series of target retirement date portfolios. For example, here we have a life cycle 2055 fund, which is for someone who's young and has more than 40 years ahead of them and will plan to retire in 2055. And we have funds every five years through 2010 and also a retirement income fund. The portfolios are designed with an asset allocation that glides appropriate for your years to retirement. They start aggressive with high allocations to stocks. And then as you approach retirement, become more conservative and have more allocations to bonds. The investment thesis behind life cycle funds in general are a human capital financial capital model. And as Bill Sharp mentioned with human capital, when you're young, you have many years ahead of you to be able to contribute and invest in your savings. So you have a large position in human capital. And hence, your financial capital can be a very aggressive when you're young. When you approach retirement and in retirement, you need to have a more balanced portfolio, a more conservative portfolio with more allocation to bonds. So life cycle funds are used today as the auto enroll. It's, it's very important to emphasize that anyone currently investing in a life cycle fund or considering it you should look at the prospectus and the material at the company's website. Each glide path is a little different and you should be aware of what you're investing in. And it's also important that life cycle funds don't guarantee an income or capital value. That if you want to go in that direction, we could talk later about annuities. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, life cycle funds, I mean, they're, they're undertaking a more sophisticated investment strategy for you by, you know, by rebalancing towards safer securities as the investor gets close to retirement and you know for that you're going to see you know the fees on life cycle funds being somewhat higher than the fees on index funds but that you know that's sort of a service you're paying for so you got to you got to take a look and, and, and see how you 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 view that view that that trade off you can also uh, you know those of you who are not in life cycle funds you can also consider doing some of that rebalancing on your on your own um, now i think uh, one a very interesting uh, topic we've kind of been touching on here is that uh, you know uh, you can think think about the uh, household balance sheet is consisting of uh, both financial capital and also human capital, and so by financial capital we mean whatever stocks or bonds or savings you might have, and by by human capital we mean the fact that your 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 labor income you know your earnings your your li your lifetime earnings that those are the fact that you own this sort of stock of whatever it is skills or education or something that kind of allows you to earn money over the course of years and I I guess uh, you know one interesting question I'll pose uh, may maybe uh, John Amrix you could you could take this up a little bit is uh, mm -hmm. you know how does how does uh, say the optimal investment strategy of somebody who has got a really really safe uh, stream of labor income. Uh, that is sort of not, you know, not really volatile or moving around in the stock market. How does that investment strategy compare to maybe the investment strategy of somebody whose who's life, lifetime earnings are essentially going to rise and fall with the fortunes of, you know, the stock market or the U.S. economy? Do you have any different recommendations so, for those kinds of people? Or? Well, sure. I mean, I, I don't know whether it's a recommendation, but it is a conclusion that comes out of the type of modeling uh, that we do that sort of posits rational behavior and well-defined preferences over risk. And in that kind of a world, uh, the correlation patterns that you're talking about, in the one situation, a very safe or secure future income stream, a college professor, let's say, um, although you'll have to decide whether the business school, the business school is uh, yeah. the safest portion of the uh, uh, oh, the no. professorship, but uh, you know, one with tenure, um, there's an income there that's uh, very, very solid, and perhaps that means you can afford to take a little bit more risk with your financial investments. And on the other hand, um, someone who's working uh, in the finance industry, who's whose uh, human capital paycheck and certainly bonus payments may be correlated with what happens in the equity markets, uh, might want to think very carefully about exactly how much uh, how much of their eggs they want to put in that basket. It's sort of a very similar problem to the company stock problem, just sort of one step removed. You know, company stock is very specifically tied to your human capital. Now we're kind of talking about relationships that are a little fuzzier, and 
there's room to move around around the edges. Um, yeah. You know, in general, estimating those correlations over very long periods of time is very, very tricky business, uh, for sure. Now, Bill Sharp, what, what, what do you think about life cycle funds and the, the strategy of, uh, of, of life, cycle, you know, life cycle investing where uh, you want to invest in the target date funds such as the ones described by John Kniff where, or what, where the, you know, the, the investors are getting rebalanced towards something that's less risky as the investors approach uh, retirement. What, what do you think of those, of the, of those strategies and how do, they, uh, you know, how do they tie in with the, sort of, with the economic theory uh, uh, surrounding asset allocation? Well, I, I think, is, as, as both John said, <clears throat> the, the best rationale for what's called the glide path, start out with a relatively high part number portion in stocks, glide down to lower portions. The rationalization or rationale for that is the human capital argument. As when, you, when you're young, the present value, if you will, of your future savings from your earnings is large and your financial capital is small. So you need to sort of think about the risk and return of the totality. And as you go closer to retirement, those proportions change. And so to keep, if you will, the same overall risk and return, you need to rebalance along some sort of glide path. Um, two things I think are important to point out. The target date funds or life cycle funds are designed with some notion of a quote, average investor in mind. Average in terms of your profession and its risk, average in terms of your risk tolerance, what have you. Um, so if you differ from the average, you're more willing to take risk or you have a different profession, then that means you have to either do something different or maybe find a, a life cycle fund that's designed for somebody older or younger than you are. The other thing I'd point out, the argument for a glide path increase in conservatism to the extent it's based on human capital falls away when you retire. And we see some funds that continue to do the, the segue post-retirement. I'm, I'm a little bit stressed trying to figure out you know, what the rationale for that is. And then the final point I would, I would point out is that um, when you look at funds for people retiring in let's say 2035 across different financial providers, they differ considerably. And of course, in any given period, their performance will differ considerably. So it's not as if there is an agreed upon notion of what that average investor's situation is. So there are different funds that take somewhat different views, even about the average investor. So there, there are a lot of uncertainties there. But that said, the basic premise is, is I think, good up to retirement. Yeah, and I think it's also worth emphasizing that you know different life cycle funds are going to be uh, rebalancing you towards you know different actual investments. So some will go more heavily into longer term nominal treasury bonds, some into shorter term treasury bonds, some into TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, uh, which are protected against uh, increases in inflation. Some into cash, uh, maybe some into other things. So it seems worthwhile if you're going to investigate these products to really look at what they're rebalancing into and consider the risks of those investments as well. You know, I, I think if your horizon is short, then you know, long-term treasury bonds, you know, they carry some risks. And before, but lest we leave it, as you have emphasized over and over again, expense ratios, expense ratios, expense ratios. Critical critical what the actual yeah. fees and expenses are. I'd like to uh, bring in a, a tweet, actually, that we've, we've come uh, from Phil Geller at Working Max. Uh, he's tweeted, in retirement, how do you go about spending down a diversified portfolio? What do you sell off first, and, uh, and what, do you, what do you retain? And that's very good timing, because I was just thinking about trying to, to get to some of those yep. ideas. Uh, what, what, what do you do if you've, you reach retirement and you say, I, I've done my best now, I have this, this, this nest egg or this balance, uh, what, 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 should I, what should I do? Uh, maybe, John Kniff, do you want to take a shot at that one? Uh, sure. Uh, yes, well, as I mentioned before, meeting with a financial advisor, looking at retirement readiness, you can have a budget for retirement, and then you have different possible sources of income. You have Social Security, potentially, 401k savings that you can draw down, potentially a defined benefit plan, annuities, or other savings. And there's tax consequences as well. So each person's situation is different. Uh, you, you did have, I noticed, a, a paper that you attached with uh, different rates. And some financial advisors historically uh, have talked about a 4% drawdown rate. 
So there's a range, but it, it'll differ based upon your asset allocation, your time horizon, your expected returns. There's a, a lot of math there uh, and assumptions in each person's situation is unique. Mm -hmm. John Emmerich, what would you add to that? Yeah, so I, those those things are right, and we try to be a little bit more, um, you know, represent a lot of the research. The four four percent rule, I think that that comes out of a variety of different places, and it, I know Bill and I have interacted over the years and and t talked a little bit about uh, where this comes from. Um, there are a lot of problems with some of the analysis that's done, but bottom line is for someone who's got a sort of endowment like view of what they're trying to do with their assets. They're really not trying to spend it down aggressively. They're trying to draw uh, some portion, uh, spend in some way, some systematic way from their portfolio. Uh, you know, you can. there are very large uh, endowments around the world that will use that kind of a 4% rate of, of drawdown assumption. So it's not unreasonable. Th that said, um, all the considerations that John's brought up are very, very important. There are some people who really are looking to spend, they saved, spent their lifetimes. They took our advice, accumulated large amounts of money, and now it's time to spend it. How do I spend it so that I am actually dipping into principal and running the balance down in such a way that it lasts as long as I want it to? Um, it'll get complicated depending on uh, time horizon and and uh, what what people are investing uh, are invested in. So the first step is sort of understanding what your objectives are for your retirement money. And when, when I when I look at uh, you know uh, the typical retirement dates and I look at uh, expected returns in the stock market and the, and the distributions of outcomes that one can expect in the stock markets, four percent seems like a pretty aggressive spend down at least in in in, in today in today's environment. I mean, it depends obviously when you retire, right? How many years you expect this to last. Uh, but it might it might be might be somewhat uh, somewhat aggressive. Uh, that brings me to the other thing that you know we've discussed a lot in the class is of course annuities. And uh, obviously, as those of you who've been taking the MOOC know, you know annuities are an interesting financial product that provides uh, longevity insurance, and uh, that is sort of insurance against living a long time. Usually, we think if you live a long time, hey, that's a great thing. I lived a long time, but it's not such a great thing if you outlive all of your resources. Um, so maybe uh, some of you on the panel could uh, speak to that. What do, you, what do you think the role is of life annuities in investor portfolios? And, and I want to be clear that here I'm talking about sort of fairly plain vanilla life annuities. I mean, there's a whole range of annuity products uh, that use the word annuity. But I'm talking about just a product where an investor you know, gives an, a, an amount of money up front to, uh, to the, the provider of the annuity, an insurance company or investment firm, and that firm promises them a guaranteed income uh, for life. What, what, what do you think the roles of that would be in investor portfolios? I'll leave any one of you who wants to grab that one to grab it. Bill Sharp. Um, I, <clears throat> well, I, I think, you know, one of the great mysteries, and you've alluded to it in the course, is that our procedures for supplement, well, saving supplemental to Social Security were for years in, in the U.S. defined benefit, which is, as you pointed out, it's an annuity. You pay in and then you take out until you die or your spouse dies, what have you. Uh, we went to a defined contribution regime, which could have a defined contribution plan could provide annuities in the plan. You could take your lump sum out at the end and buy an annuity. And almost nobody does. I mean, it's like maybe 10% of some number in that range of the DC money at retirement is annuitized. So we, there's been this tectonic shift away from using your savings to buy assured income till you die to schemes, and there are a million schemes, and there's no 4% rule that you mentioned, and there's no settled agreement in the industry or certainly in academe on the, the desirability of this scheme or that scheme for this person or that person. That's an area of, of, of incredible turmoil at the moment, but I think annuities are fine. You know, if you're very rich, why, why bother? You know, you're, you're happy to have large amounts of your wealth go to your kids or your charities. But for people who are close to it, where the Social Security annuity is not enough, and they really aren't in a position to take much risk with the remainder or plan to leave a lot to their heirs, uh, I think annuities are extremely sensible uh, ways to take care of your post-retirement needs. But for a number of reasons, some behavioral, some otherwise perhaps, we don't see a lot of voluntary annuitization, which concerns me. 
You know, I mean, it's interesting because I think a lot of people uh, get to retirement. They say, okay, what should I do? Then they think about maybe buying an annuity. And they look at the rates and they say, gee, you know, I'm going to fork over $100,000 at this point. And I'm only going to get paid $400, $500 a month. That's a frightening proposition to, uh, to, to, to a lot of people. And it also raises the idea of uh, products that might actually uh, kind of default you into some annuitization before. And now, John Kniff, you know, TIA CREF has a long history of providing yes. uh, products that have an annuity yes. feature with them. Uh, I don't know, do you want to say any words about those, the, the role of those products? Yeah, we, yes, here at TIA CREF, we have a very long history with annuities. Our TIA traditional account dates back to 1918. Our Kraft stock account dates back to 1952. It's the first variable annuity in America. And a benefit that TIA offers is that uh, in our plans, in many of our plans, you have the opportunity during your working years to contribute to annuity. And that seems from a behavioral point of view, as Bill Sharp was mentioning, that that can help people stay in annuity through retirement. And annuities provide guaranteed income uh, for years in retirement or potentially your lifetime. There's at least two types of annuity, a fixed annuity that'll provide a guaranteed income for a period of time, and then also variable annuities, which could provide higher income, but have exposure to the stock market as well. So that can vary. I mean, that's the way I think about these products. You can correct me if I'm, if I'm, if I'm wrong. But the way I think about them is during the working life, you know, an individual is basically accruing, you know, rights to receive an annuity when he or she retires. And that uh, if that's a fixed, you know, fixed deferred annuity, that amount is going to be uh, not a function of how the stock market does or other assets that things are invested in. If it's, uh, uh, if it's a variable annuity, then it is going to be a, uh, a function of the, uh, of the stock market. John Emmerichs, well, well, would you, you want to weigh in here a little bit on uh, the, uh, this question of annuities, uh, life annuities, fixed it's, annuities, it's deferred annuities, variable annuities? I'd, I'd love to, and uh, probably your class doesn't have enough time to hear everything I have to say about it. It's, uh, it's been an area of, of active academic research for me for about 15 years, um, thinking about, you know, why, why do people choose annuities? Why don't they? Um, you know, I, I view them very much as very useful to provide a floor of income. You know, they, they do for retirees, provide someone with the ability to know, you know, how much will I have as a base for my income going forward? You think about Social Security, we think about defined benefit pensions as forms of annuities. Many, many people have those. Um, by far the most fascinating thing to me is that where, we, where uh, auto enrollment, as I mentioned earlier, and life cycle funds, um, when those are used as default options in retirement savings plans, the rates at which people reject those defaults are very small. Most people go along with that. They enter into the plan, they save, they also seem to go along with and be happy with the glide paths that we've talked about. The one big difference about annuities at the point of retirement is people seem to actively want to unannuitize. There is active deannuitization going on. So a couple of different forms. People retiring with defined benefit plan entitlements that, that uh, the default payout is an annuity, will elect to take a cash payment instead. The other thing is, is many retirement plan participants, uh, when looking at their assets and are in a form of a plan that requires annuitization, will take a spouse to a notary public in order to get a permission to take the money out of the plan as a lump sum. So the behavioral issues are very complex. Uh, and I think it relates to thinking about retirement security in a very, very different way maybe than we have traditionally. Um, income is very, very important. We need to have some, but there are expenditures and events that happen in retirement that are not uh, linear in nature, that, that are not, you can't buy insurance for them. You can't know that it's gonna cost you X dollars a year for the rest of your life to deal with long-term care necessarily. Um, and, you know, those types of risks um, are what I'm currently studying, trying to find out whether, as Bill mentioned, is this irrational? Is this people saying irrationally that I can do better and I don't have to worry about longevity risk? Or is it something that's a little bit more reasonable and rational that, no, I, I can't predict what my situation is going to be in 20 mm -hmm. years. I want to maximize flexibility and I need liquid assets mm -hmm. to do that. We don't know the answers right now. We don't know now. the answer. We don't know the answer. So, yeah, I'd like to uh, turn and take another tweet. I'm also looking forward in a minute to getting the poll results. Um, so uh, let's take another uh, tweeted question uh, from Chen Chang, uh, I-E-C-H-E-N. Are financial advisors worth it at 1%? Uh, most don't want you unless you have a million dollars. 
How do you get there in the meantime? Anybody want to want to talk to that? Speak to that. Bill Sharp, please, yeah. Professor. <clears throat> well, um, we are seeing the growth of online uh, lower cost quote financial advice. Uh, at this point, is very highly varied quality, but uh, as you point out in the in the uh, in the course, one percent is a big chunk. If you're you know, if you're going to take, say, 4% out and your advisor is going to take another 1%, in, in some ways you're losing one-fifth, 1% 1 divided by 4 plus 1, uh, which is a huge, huge hit. Uh, Vanguard has tools that can show you this in, in the accumulation phase. But uh, you better be getting an awful lot if you're paying 1% a year every year during your retirement. So there needs to be some way, and there, there are other procedures, sometimes through your employer, you can get what amounts to a, a tailored uh, procedure post-retirement as well. Mm -hmm. But we need to bring the costs down uh, significantly. That's just too much. Mm. Well, uh, I want to actually go over uh, some of these survey results if we've got them. Um, it'd be great to be able to uh, tell you how people answered the, uh, answered the survey. Um, so in how many years do you plan to retire of our viewership? Uh, it turns out that about 25% of you are retired. Only 3% of you do not plan to retire. 11% of you have got 30 or more years to retirement. Uh, and uh, around a quarter of you have got 10 to 30 years to retirement. And uh, 34 of you have 0 to 10. So some, 34% uh, have 0 to 10. So wow. I, I would say, and we had, we had uh, over 1,500 votes here. So I, I would say uh, there is definitely a, um, uh, a lot of people who are getting close to retirement who are, who are thinking about these issues. Um, if we have the other questions up there, it would be great to see those. What percentage of your 401k do you invest in stocks or equity mutual funds? Well, this is great. We've got a, uh, a great distribution here. So we've got about 10% of you invest uh, less than 20%, 8%, 20 to 40%. And then a lot of people, uh, you know, around 30% investing, uh, 40 to 60%, 60 to 80, and 80 to 100. So a fair number of uh, stock investors here. Um, the next question was related to whether you think stocks are safer in the long run than they are in the short run. Um. And 74% of, of, our, of our viewers said that stocks are safer in the long run than in the short run. Uh, and 17% said no, 9% said I don't know. Now, before I go to that last question, uh, which was about life cycle uh, strategies, I'd just like somebody on the panel, maybe, maybe uh, John Amerix, could speak a little bit to uh, this question of whether stocks are safer in the long run than the short run, because there, there definitely seems to be a view out there that, uh, that they are. What, yeah. what do you think of that? Well, you know, I, I think this, this again is, you know, the way you asked the question in terms of safer, we, we know that um, in the mathematical sense, uh, based on the studies, that the, the risks that people face, e even though um, stocks uh, will appear to have high rates of return with low uh, volatilities around the annual averages over long periods of time, uh, you can still uh, save for 25 years and get to a point in 2008 where you've seen above average returns for most of your lifetime and in a course of uh, a few short months lose lose half of that. So, uh, you know, I would be very careful with the notion that stocks are safer uh, in, in the long term in that sense. Um, uh, however, you know, the life cycle considerations that we've talked about, if you think about the answer to that question, are they safer for me as a young investor than as an older investor, um, you know, because of the flexibilities that human capital provides, uh, they, can, they can make a little bit more sense for younger mm -hmm. investors than for older investors, but it shouldn't be interpreted as a yeah. safety of the investment option itself. I have to go to Bill so Sharp. Is, is what, I have to go to Bill Sharp and ask him what, what he thinks is one of the founders of finance theory. I need to need to ask this question should, to you, Bill. I should tell you, this statement has driven me crazy for 50 years, uh. and that's 5-0. <laughs> um, it, it comes from a really misleading kind of analysis in which you say, what is the average or the geometric term, return that we've talked about over 100 years versus 50 versus 10. Here's the simple idea. Put $100 in stocks today. Look at the range of how much you would have in one year and look at the, the bad part of that. You know, how bad could it be? Look at, think about putting $100 in stocks today and waiting 10 years and look at how bad it could be in 10 years, how much money you would have. It could be a lot worse if you hold for 10 years than if you hold for one year. 
And that is, and even if there's mean reversion and some of the other things we've talked about, that's just a fact. Uh, the idea that you look at something called the geometric mean return or the arithmetic mean return is basically irrelevant in terms of what matters for risk is how bad could it be? Um, the, the worst outcome or the 10% worst outcome, whatever. So in no important serious sense, economic sense, personal sense, is it true that stocks are less risky in the long run? Well, very interesting. I, 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 I concur. And I'd just like to, you know, we're, we're pretty much at our time, but I'd like to wrap up a little bit. I just want to do this one last question. Have you reduced or do you plan to reduce your exposure to stocks in your 401k as you approach retirement? And 62% of you said yes. 38% of you said no. So 62% of you are sort of following this uh, life cycle portfolio theory. 38% have said no. And of course, you also might, if you're invested in target date funds, you might not be aware uh, whether you've done it or not. So uh, those target date funds are actually rebalancing you uh, out of stocks. Um, so very interesting to see that some people are, some people aren't. Perhaps those people who, uh, uh, who are not have different investment goals. They have different, uh, maybe they've got a longer time horizon. Perhaps uh, it's the case that they're hoping to leave some money to their, to their beneficiaries. Um, so I guess I'll uh, ask one more tweet question, and then we'll wrap it up, if that would be possible. Um, so uh, someone has asked, Patty uh, Eisenhower has asked, as some of us near retirement in 10 years, are investments like bond funds really less risky than stock mutual funds? So what about bond <laughs> funds? Are they, are, they, are, they less, are they less risky then in that case? Are they really less risky? Uh, uh, who wants to take a stab at that one? Maybe John Kniff, would you like to take a stab at that one? Sure. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm very glad. Well, there's a lot of financial risk as you approach retirement. There's market risk, inflation risk, and longevity risk. I mean, one way to offset market risk, which is you invest in stocks, they may fall and be volatile, is to invest in bonds. Yields currently are low, but they do pay coupons. Yields will most likely gradually rise over time, uh, and that, that will eat something into the return there. Uh, but over a long period of time, they do provide less volatility, can offset uh, market risk. Inflation risk could be offset with investments in inflation-linked bonds or indirectly through stocks. And longevity risk, risk of outliving your savings, generally consider an annuity. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think it's time that we've uh, wrapped up our at the end of our time here. I want to thank you all for participating. Great. Uh, thanks for participating in the surveys. Thanks to those of you who tweeted in. I'm sorry we didn't get to every uh, tweet today, um, but looking forward to doing one of these webinars again with you all in the future. Those of you who are not in the MOOC, feel free to check out the MOOC. Uh, those of you who are in the MOOC, thank you very much for your participation. I hope that you're getting something out of it and looking forward to your continued participation in the discussion forums. So thank you very much to everybody and have a great evening.